Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. We'll continue now our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Briefly recapping uh, where we ended up yesterday was that the, because of the pap papal decree of infallibility, the Roman Catholic Church sought to elevate the Pope's authority over the temporal governments of Germany and Austria. And this resulted in a tremendous conflict within the Roman Catholic Church. Many members of the Roman Catholic Church insisted that the civil government had legitimate authority. And they loved their government. And they understood the danger of the decree of papal infallibility and the supposed divine right of the Pope to change the government that they so loved to be more responsive to the Pope and not to the people of Germany. They were called old Catholics. They defended the duly elected or duty, duly constituted government of Germany. And the Pope saw this as rebellion by these Roman Catholics, and excommunicated them, and took away every privilege of the Roman Catholic Church. They couldn't uh, say Mass, they couldn't participate in the sacraments, and they were, not, for all tents, intents and purposes, damned. And their rights were uh, trampled on by the papacy, and the government, seeing this persecution against the old Catholics by the papacy and the ultramontane wing of the Roman Catholic Church sought to pass laws to protect their rights. And that's what pitted the German government against the papacy and vice versa. The German Reichstag passed laws condemning the Jesuits and the Ultramontanes and kicked the Jesuits out of the country and limited the activities of even other orders of the Roman Catholic Church and literally defended its right to govern. Now, the Pope saw this as an invasion of the Pope's jurisdiction. The Pope believes that he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the King of Germany raised up in support of the Pope's internal enemies the old Catholics, and it led to a, 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 a big controversy in Germany. It says, in their view, we're beginning uh, where we left off uh, yesterday on page 179, about uh, a quarter of the way up from the bottom of the page. It says, in their view, they were invasion of the Pope's jurisdiction, these laws passed by the Reichstag and the kicking out the Jesuits. In other words, the government, according to the papacy, the government of Germany had encroached upon the Pope's rights by kicking out the Jesuits and uh, uh, defending these, these old Catholics. And it said they demanded that as the Pope represented God, and the Emperor William represented the state, the latter, Emperor William, should permit the former, that is the Pope, to enter his dominions as a domestic prince and dictate what laws concerning the Roman Catholic Church, its faith and its priesthood, should be executed and what should be disobeyed. R. W. Thompson says that was and is today the sole question of controversy between the German Empire and the papacy, just as it is between the papacy and all other governments, the United States included. Although the issue grows out of, a different, uh, out of different measures of government policy, it is substantially the same everywhere. And therefore, when the Pope accompanies his claim of secular princedom with the sentiments already quoted from his encyclical of December 23, 1872, he intended that the, the encouragement he thereby gave the violations of the law in Germany should equally apply 
to all other governments where the rights of the papacy, as he announced them, are either denied or violated. Governments have no more important question to deal with than this. Their existence may depend upon it. Whatever and however varied their domestic policy may be, they should decide it for themselves. The moment they allow a foreign power, the papacy, to dictate it in any essential particular, that moment they lose their independence and sink into imbecility. That is right. They become imbeciles because the Pope thinks for them from then on. The Pope is, becomes King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and it's not a matter of reason. It's not a matter of, 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 of uh, national sovereignty or anything else. It's just a matter of doing whatever the Pope says. You reduce to an animal. You're reduced to a blubbering idiot, reduced to imbecility. You don't have any right to think. All you have to do is to obey. Now, while the American people have no just right to concern themselves about the internal policy of the German Empire, it being fully competent to manage its own affairs, it is important that they should know how far the Roman Catholic mind in this country is likely to be affected by the teachings of the Pope in reference to those who have so offensively violated the Pope's laws. If this power over the sentiments and opinions of his followers in the United States is as great as it is in Germany, and there's no reason to suppose that it's not, then although there may be no immediate open resistance to the principles of our government, which, he has con which the Pope has condemned, the fact exists that there is a cherished purpose to make it whenever there is reasonable promise of success. In other words, there is a reason to suspect that the Catholics of this country will rise up in opposition to our government at a time when it can be reasonably uh, uh, promised that they will succeed. Now he says, we may not fear resistance, but always better prepared to meet it when aware when it is contemplated. The seeds of disease are more easily removed before they become diffused throughout the system. One of the fathers of the Republic gave us this admonition, quote, against the insidious wiles of foreign influence, I conjure you to believe me, fellow citizens, the jealousy of a free people ought to be constantly awake, since history and experience prove that foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of Republican government. Unquote. That's from George Washington's farewell address. And one of the great men of our own times, contemplating the possible dangers which might result from even the foreign ownership of stock in our moneyed institutions, said this. Now listen to this very carefully. Listen to this quote very carefully, and keep in your mind, the back of your mind, while I read this, the Federal Reserve Bank. Listen to what this man says. Of the course which we uh, of the course which would be pursued by a bank almost wholly owned by the subjects of a foreign power and managed by those interests, if not affections, would run in the same direction, there could be no doubt. All its operations within would be in aid of hostile fleets and armies without. Controlling our currency, receiving our public monies, and holding thousands of our citizens in dependence, it would be more formidable and dangerous than the naval or military power of an enemy." Unquote. Now let's break this down. Why did I uh, advise my listeners to be thinking about the Federal Reserve Bank as I read this quote? Again, he says, of the course which would be pursued 
by a bank almost wholly owned by the subjects of a foreign power. Is the federal bank owned by subjects of a foreign power? Absolutely right. The Federal Reserve is a private bank. It is owned and operated by the Rothschild banking dynasty, the guardians of the Vatican Treasury, and, and it, it's the Pope's money. Okay, it's the Pope's bank. You could think of it as a Jesuit bank. Okay, do they have an interest? Does the Jesuits and the uh, the Vatican have an interest in this country? You better believe it. The same interest that they had in the German in Germany, control of the government. And this author warns that a bank, what per, what direction a bank would pursue, if it was wholly owned by the subject of a foreign power. Who is the foreign power the Rothschilds work for? The papacy. Okay? And it continues with a quote, and managed by those interests, if not affections, that affections for the Pope, right, would run in the same direction, there could be no doubt. In other words, it would have a single aim. And what would that aim be? All its operations within would be in aid of hostile fleets and armies without. All right, all the internal operations of the Federal Reserve Bank, a foreign-owned and operated bank that prints the currency for this country, it's owned by the, 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 the papacy, it's run by the Rothschild banking dynasty, which are just cooperative third parties for the, for the Vatican, for the Jesuits. And all of their internal operations are simply to provide financing and aid for hostile fleets and armies without. Controlling our currency, that is the, the precise job of the Federal Reserve Bank, controlling our currency Receiving our public monies. How do they receive our public monies? Well, the the federal the uh, the uh, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, was simply created to collect the debt owed to the Federal Reserve Bank, the national debt. This is how uh, the Federal Reserve Bank is our creditor. The Pope is our creditor through the Federal Reserve Bank. And they've got us steeped in debt, uneven, unable to pay. A debt so high that we could never pay it. So we owe our entire wealth to the Vatican, and it's collected through the Internal Revenue Service. The Internal Revenue Service was, was created to tax the people to help pay the debt owed to the Federal Reserve Bank, a bank owned by the Vatican and operated by the Rothschilds, the guardians of the Vatican Treasury. And continuing with the quote, controlling our currency, receiving our public monies through the IRS, and holding thousands of our citizens and dependents, that's every man, woman, and child now in the United States of America owes something in the order of about a quarter of a million dollars, I think, at the last, the last time I saw the figure. And it, and it says, and it would be more formidable and dangerous than the naval or military power of an enemy. So what, what, did, our, what did this man, this, this is a quote, and this is from uh, Jackson's veto of the Bank of the United States. Okay, Andrew Jackson. All right, he, he has told us that if we ever allow a foreign bank to control the currency of this country, the proceeds or the profit of that bank would use to be, be used to finance a foreign invasion. And this is exactly what the Federal Reserve Bank does. That... Our Constitution leaves no opportunity for a foreign bank to operate to regulate the currency of this country. That belongs 
to the Treasury Department. The Federal Reserve Bank is an illegal bank, unconstitutionally constituted, if you will. And it has one purpose, to enslave this nation, to reduce us to servitude and slavery, and to take away our rights and our independence as a nation. We are the debtor to the Pope, to the tune of trillions of dollars. Now, I know this is a hard sell for people who just simply dismiss it as lunacy, I mean, which is no argument at all. All they have to do is research the matter. Find out who owns the Federal Reserve Bank. Now, the nation did not stand in the uh, the nation did not stand in the immediate presence of any danger from foreign influences when these sentiments were uttered. Their distinguished authors looked to precautionary measures alone. And how much more formidable and dangerous than a few stockholders in a moneyed corporation are a multitude of men moved by a single impulse, compacted together by a common sentiment, and ready at the direction of a foreign prince to aim their blows openly or secretly at such principles of our government as he may condemn upon the plea that they belong to the spiritual order over which God alone has placed the Pope as the sole sovereign and infallible judge. He's talking about the Roman Catholic population of this country. They are a corporation of a multitude of men moved by a single impulse, the raising of their pope to supremacy, compacted together by a common sentiment and ready at the direction of their foreign prince, the pope, to aim their blows openly and secretly at such principles of our government, our Protestant principles, as the pope may condemn upon the plea that those principles belong to the spiritual order over which God presides, who has placed the Pope as the sole sovereign and infallible judge. Now, on the 25th of May of March, uh, 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 the 25th day of March, 1873, a very large meeting of the Catholic Germans of Philadelphia was held in that city. Its avowed object was for the purpose of placing upon record their sympathy with their oppressed and persecuted fellow Catholics in Germany, and to congratulate them and their noble Roman Catholic priestly hierarchy upon the heroic stand they had taken in the face of persecuting government. That is, upon their resistance to the laws regularly and legally enacted. Okay? The Roman Catholics are getting together in this country to publicly praise the, the Roman Catholic rebels of Germany. Those Roman Catholics who believed the, Pope, the Pope's rights had been uh, encroached upon by the German government who rose up in rebellion against the German government. We have American Catholics congratulating them. What do you think? Roman Catholics in this country should do, seeing that they are under a Protestant government. They should be lauded as heroes to raise up against a Protestant government to make the government Catholic. It's common sense. This very large and public meeting of these Catholic Germans of Philadelphia was an indication of just how disloyal these same Catholics were of our own government. It says that its avowed object, that is, the avowed object of this meeting, was for the purpose of placing upon record their sympathy with their oppressed and persecuted fellow Catholics of Germany and to congratulate them and their noble hierarchy upon the heroic stand they had taken in the face of the persecuting government. 
that is, upon their resistance to laws regularly and legally enacted. The bishops of Philadelphia, Scranton, and Harrisburg were all present at this meeting, accompanied by a large number of the reverend clergy. Uh, they've always got their priests at these functions. And it says, Clapping of hands, hearty cheers, and strains of music enlivened the occasion. Eloquent addresses were delivered, but one by the pastor of St. Bonifacius produced a sweeping effect and great enthusiasm because of its castigation of Bismarck, Garibaldi and Company, its praise of the Jesuits, and its adulation of Pope Pius IX, whom he called the fearless Hildebrand of the 19th century. When the proper decree of excite the proper degree of excitement had been produced, resolutions with an ex explanatory preamble were adopted. They enumerate the terrible persecutions which had been visited upon their quote unquote fellow Catholics in Germany as follows. Number one, number one, notice number one, the expulsion of the Jesuits. Number two, the encroachment on the constitutional rights of the German Catholic hierarchy by retaining in their positions and dignities the old Catholics whom they denounced as faithless, faithless sons of the church. Number three, the encroachment upon the rights of conscience by keeping those who had abandoned the faith, that is, the old Catholics, in charge of the public schools. Number four, the unchristianizing of the schools. In view of these arbitrary and tyrannical measures, they expressed their sympathy with their German brethren as Germany's truest sons and most faithful citizens because they obey the Pope rather than the German government. They admire the bearing of the German episcopacy, uh, episcopacy for their open hostility to their government and condemn to them, excuse me, and commend to them the sublime example of the Pope whom they are so nobly following. They declare their inexpressible joy at the constancy of endurance shown by the whole German clergy in opposing the laws and their subsequent beautiful submission to the Church. And then... They express their conviction that the Catholics of Germany will continue to value their faith above all other blessings, that is, above the empire, and that they will be always ready to, quote, sacrifice life and all things for its dear sake. Whether the great bulk of those who composed this large meeting understood the import of all this is somewhat problematical. But of one thing there can be no reasonable doubt, that the three bishops and the reverend clergy understood it fully as the mere means of preserving unity among their, fo their followers nobody has any right, and probably very few have any inclination to object to it. It is only of consequence in view of the principles enunciated and the attitude in which the papal training places those who are entirely submissive to the Roman Catholic hierarchy and who in other respects are good and peaceable citizens. See how in an instant the priests of Rome can raise Roman Catholics to a position of rebellion against their governments. As the mere means of preserving unity among their followers, nobody has any right and probably very few have any inclination to object to it, that is, the resolution. It is only of consequence in view of the principles enunciated and the attitude in which the papal training places those who are entirely submissive to the hierarchy and who in other respects are good and peaceable citizens. These latter are not responsible, for their church does not allow them to reason about church affairs the hierarchy command, they obey. What did the hierarchical manipulators of this meeting mean? This only, 
to teach their followers that the measures of the German Empire, which they called persecution, belonged to the church, were of the faith, were outside the temporal jurisdiction of human governments, pertained only to the spiritual order, and therefore could only be decided upon by the Pope. Now, with the single exception of the expulsion of the Jesuits, all the enumerated grievances of which they complain in Germany exist in the United States. Our government gives protection to every church and every religious order. It confides the public school it, it confides the public schools to men of every faith and of none. It maintains quote unquote unchristian or as they choose to call them godless schools. In other words, the schools don't preach the Christian religion. The, the public schools of the United States are merely secular. It's up to every family to educate their children up, uh, upon their religion. They don't mix religion with education in the public schools. That's to allow religious liberty in the country so that there's not a state-sponsored religion. Okay? It had its purpose. It was, it was a, a polite way not to offend people of other religions in the country who wanted to go to the public schools. All right? And it says, all these things and others of like import, it considers as belonging to temporal affairs, the regulation of which is under the exclusive cognizance of laws passed by the state. Hence, when they recognized the Pope as having authority over these temporal matters in Germany on account of his spiritual supremacy, they must be understood as meaning that he has like authority in the United States. As the fundamentals of our government heretofore indicated belong to the same class of temporals, so in their view, the Pope has the same power to release them from obligation of obedience to them as he has to release the fellow Catholics in Germany from their obligation of obedience to the laws of their own country. So the same condition exists here in the, in the, in the United States. The same things that they complained about in Germany also exist in the United States. The United, if Germany was trampling upon the rights of the Pope, Certainly, the United States government tramples upon the rights of the Pope. So this support for the rebellious German Catholics is perfectly indicative of what the true feelings of these Roman Catholics would be toward our government. Now, this logical conclusion cannot be escaped in reference to all these fundamental con these fundamentals condemned by the Pope. But there's even more than this to show that he would have them to go one step farther and substitute the divine right of kings to govern for that now possessed by the people. The ultimate goal of the papacy, I will add, is that this government of, by, and for the people is heresy. It is topsy-turvy. It, among all things, violates the divine right of the Pope to govern the people. The Pope is not to be governed by the people. And as the mediator between the Pope and the people, that is, the government, the, the people should not rule the government. So the Pope cannot without doing insult to his own divine right position as vicar of Christ on the earth, cannot condone the people being in charge of the government. Now, this is the very state of affairs that took place in Germany. And we just have to know that Roman Catholics viewed their rights as being com uh, completely obliterated when they live in a country where the people rule. 
because their pope's rights are eliminated. He's nothing but a priest. He's not a king. And by divine right, he's to be king. So the government has to be changed, just as it was, in, just as they asserted in Germany. Now, R. W. Thompson continues. He says, if he considers that God has established this right, then it must be a necessary part of the faith. For whatever he declares to be the law of God must be so if he is infallible. And if it is of the faith that kings govern by divine right, it must be maintained as well in the United States as at Rome. For otherwise, the Roman Catholic Church does not possess a uniform faith and forfeits her claim to universality. You, you comprehend what he's saying here? If the Pope cannot be king in the United States, he can't be king anywhere. It says, one might suppose that the anxiety exhibited by Roman Catholics in the United States for the success of de Camberg in France and Don Carlos in Spain would leave but little doubt upon the subject. But this is not sufficient of itself to settle the question. The Pope interprets the law of God and establishes the faith. Quote, when Rome has spoken, that is the end of the matter. Unquote. Some time ago, Monsignor Seeger, from whom we quoted in a former chapter, prepared a pamphlet with the title Viva Le Roy, which he presented to the Count de Camberd, who claims that he is the legitimate heir, by divine right, to the throne of France. The object of this pamphlet was to demonstrate the nature and existence of this right. An American review of it from the pen of a Roman Catholic, probably a Jesuit, thus states his proposition. Quote, Henry V presents himself to France in the name of him, capital H, from whom emanates all rights and all legitimate sovereignty. He is king of France, not in virtue of the capricious will of the people, but in virtue of the order established by God. He is king of France by divine right. Unquote. The nature of this right is defined to be, quote, the right of God, and, quote, a true right of property, which cannot be taken away without robbery. And it is said, quote, though it results from human facts, it is no less divine, and hence it may be said that by divine right he possesses the crown. On these matters there exists a great confusion of ideas owing to the vulgar notions put, afo put afloat by revolutionists. There's a derogatory reference to the Protestant Reformation, out of which we get governments of, by, and for the people. They call Protestantism revolutionary. A revolution, a rebellion against the papacy. <clears throat> now, but, the, but for fear of possible collision between claimants and differences of opinion as to the particular individual so favored by providence, and so as not to oust the Pope from his lofty position of supremacy over the world, he makes him the infallible arbiter. His final decision, rendered from whatever motive, is conclusive as to who shall be and who shall not be king. He alone knows what the will of God is, and when he has decided, the nation must obey. There's no appeal. The people have no will in the matter. They are slaves. He is their master. Now, let me, let me back up and read this and point out something of importance. He may, uh, his final decision, rendered from whatever motive, motive is conclusive as to who shall be and who shall not be king. This is explicit, and it affects every man, woman, and child on the planet. This is... 
explanatory of the claim that the Pope is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It says, His decisions rendered from whatever motive is conclusive as to who shall be and who shall not be king. The Pope picks all the kings of the earth. The papacy has, instil, has installed in the world agencies, and in the case of the United States, as researcher uh, Eric John Phelps asserts, and I agree, the Council on Foreign Relations is the one who picks the candidates for presidency. The Council on Foreign Relations is a Vatican servant. The Council on Foreign Relations is run by Knights of Malta and high-level Freemasons, other groups subservient to the Jesuit order, and they are the ones who pick the candidates for the presidency of this country, the King of America. And whether he be Democratic candidate or Republican candidate, when you go to the polls, you're voting for someone the Pope has picked. The Pope still picks the king in America. America is no exception. It has this vast uh, outward appearance that the people actually pick their ruler, but the, but the Pope picks all the candidates. The Americans dutifully go to the polls and place their vote, thinking that they've done a great patriotic duty, when in reality... They've just picked between two papal candidates. The Pope doesn't care a whit who you vote for. So why vote? I'm telling you, the system of politics in this country would not miss a stroke, would not miss a beat, if the American people simply stayed home for a presidential election. Boycotted it, not a single vote cast, our government would continue without a beat. The Pope would simply nominate his pick, and all pretenses would be put aside. The American people would see for themselves somebody other than the people of this country run this government. Will the American people ever do it? No, they don't believe it. Most people that I talk to about this subject just either listen in stunned silence or they openly ridicule this notion that the papacy has anything to do with the elections in this country. But by divine right, according to the papacy, he and only he has the authority to pick the kings of the earth. And are we to suppose that the Pope makes an exception for the United States, an exception for Protestant USA? Now, that's absurd. That's absurd. For someone to insist that the political system of this country is exactly what it appears to be, despite all the derogatory feelings there is in among, among the American people for the political system as it operates in this country, it's absurd to assert that the papacy has no role to play in picking the candidates for presidency of this country when he claims by divine right to be the king of kings. It's absurd, beyond absurd, to assert that the Pope keeps his hands off the election of the president for this Protestant country. Now, he continues... He says the people have no will in the matter. That's what he said. The people who think they run the government, he says the people have no will in the matter. They are slaves. The Pope is their master. This writer pointed out, uh, this writer pointing out the mode of knowing with certitude upon whom rests this divine right, and insisting that when this is ascertained, quote, he is the depository of the rights of God for the good of his country. And here's what else he says. 
And if, moreover, the Roman Catholic Church, that is the Pope, should find in hands his rights, uh, should take in hands his rights, protecting him with her sympathies and with her divine authority and certitude, at least for Christians, become such that doubt would seem no longer permitted. If the Pope really took a hold of his rights, there would be no permission to doubt what he, did, what he says. In other words, it would be a violation of law to doubt what he says. And that system is already in place in the Roman Catholic Church. Every Roman Catholic is threatened of pain, on pain of excommunication if he does not acquiesce his intellect and his will and his conscience to the teachings of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, the greatest hierarch of which is the Pope. They're eternally damned if they depart from the teachings of the church. It's simply not permitted. It says, and if moreover the Roman Catholic Church, that is the Pope, should take in hands his rights, protecting him with her sympathies and with her divine authority and, cert and certitude, at least for Christians, becomes such that doubt would seem no longer permitted. Now, if these were only individual opinions of Monsignor Seeger, he should be left undisturbed as an avowed supporter of a monarchy to enjoy them and to preach them if he deemed it his duty to the French people. They would undoubtedly be most acceptable to the ears of many hearers and especially to all the hierarchy of France who are at this time acting upon them as of the faith with the hope that they were, may persuade the Roman Catholic people of that country to place Count de Cambert upon the throne and destroy the Republic. Because, as we are told by this American reviewer, quote, he has given the solemn promise that once on the throne of France, he will take up the cause of the Pope. And then the sword of Charlemagne shall spring from the scabbard and convoke, as of old, the Catholic peoples to the rescue of Rome from the miserable and despicable Italian apostates. That's right. He was going to take over the throne of France and then lead France to liberate Italy and throw it back in the Pope's hands. Remember, Victor Emmanuel had liberated Italy from the Pope. And he called that a a diabolical encroachment upon his divine right. The papacy was outraged and was looking for a mercenary army in France to come and restore to him his authority in Italy. You see how the papacy works. He picked the king of France knowing that the king of France would raise up an army to overthrow the government, the republic that had usurped itself in Italy and disposed or deposed the Pope as king. And it says, but high as the author of these sentiments is in the, in the estimation of the hierarchy, he has secured to them a higher endorsement than his own, so that all who shall unite for these objects may be assured that they are serving God and the church. He laid this pamphlet before Pope Pius IX, who, in expressing his approval of it, thus addressed him, quote, Pius IX, Pope, to his beloved son, greeting an apostolic benediction. We have received your new pamphlet, and we wish from the bottom of our hearts that it may, be dis that it may dispel from others the errors of, which you, enlightened by the mis misfortunes of your country, have had the happiness of rejecting. In fact, it is, not the it is not the impious sects alone that conspire against the church and against society. It is also those men who, even should we suppose them the most perfect good faith and the most straightforward intentions, 
caress the liberal doctrines, which the Holy See has many times disapproved of, doctrines which favor principles whence all revolutions take their birth, and more pernicious, perhaps, as at first sight they have a shadow of generosity. Principles evidently impious can only affect, in, fa in fact, uh, can only affect, in fact, minds already corrupted. But principles that veil themselves with patriotism and the zeal of religion, principles that put forward the, the aspirations of honest men, easily seduce good people and turn them away unconsciously from the true doctrine to errors which speedily take larger development and translating into acts their ultimate consequences shake all social and ruin shake, uh, shake all social order and ruin peoples what he's talking about is protestants it's 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 a counter reformation is what he's talking about and it says Certainly, beloved son, if you shall have by this pamphlet the happiness of bringing round many, uh, bringing round many up to this time in error, it will be of great reward. Who's in error? Those who rebel against the authority of the Pope. If your pamphlet restores to me my divine right, then you have done the Church a magnificent service. This man is praised. Rebellion against free government is the, the occupation of the papacy. Raising up Roman Catholic rebellion against free government, against popular government, that is, governments that are popular with the people, governments that serve the people, governments established on the Protestant principle is the primary occupation of the papacy. So where does that put the United States of America? Now, people who are very shallow in their thinking would think, well, gee, I live right next door to Catholics. They don't preach against the government. Tom, Tom's making all this up. Tom's trying to start a religious war. Don't forget, Roman Catholics are taught not to upset Protestants. Roman Catholics are taught just obey the Pope. Now, everything was hunky-dory in Germany until the Pope asserted his divine right, until the Pope asserted his infallible status, and then commanded the people of Germany to rise up against the government to make the Pope the king of the land. You say it can't happen here? That your peaceable Roman Catholic neighbor might not turn out to be your worst enemy if the Pope commanded it? He did it in Germany. He's done it all over the world. It's been the occupation of the papacy for 15, 1800 years. Raising up rebellions against governments who are not subservient to the papacy. There's no difference in the United States than there was in Germany. This so-called peace, this ecumenical peace, could be upset in an instant. All the Pope has to do is assert his divine right, his infallible status, and threaten every Roman Catholic with excommunication if they don't rise up against the government. And all of a sudden, your friendship with that Roman Catholic has been destroyed. And the Catholic serves his Pope as though he were God on earth. The peace can be disrupted in an hour. That's what happened in Germany, and that's what's going to happen in the United States of America. Inquisition update tomorrow. Thanks for listening.